has it, and even where in the brain creativity resides. And I'm here to tell you that most of you are dead wrong. <laughs> there's a lot of creativity on display at these talks, and there's a lot of creativity out there in the audience as well. Where did this creativity come from? Why are some people more creative than others? What is the definition of creativity? I like this definition. Creativity is the production of something both novel and useful. And this is an important dichotomy. For the mere production of novelty, for novelty's sake, is pointless. And strict adherence to utility has been done to death. It is this back and forth between novelty and usefulness that, create, that is making for true creative innovation. It's also interesting what's going on in the brain, this back and forth between what is known and what is unknown. As neuroscientists, we're learning that the brain is malleable, like a muscle, and that if you use it in a certain way, over and over, you can change its very structure over time. Could you shape your brain to be more creative? I believe that there's nothing more important to our culture, to our economy, perhaps even to our very survival as a species than to identify and cultivate the next generation of creative innovators in our society. How are we gonna do that? This is one of the most important ideas, I think, that you see running through all of these talks today. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover, including the good, the bad, and the ugly of creativity research. And first things first, or last things first, as I'm going to start with the ugly lies that you've been told about creativity. These are the, this is the dead wrong stuff. And since I'm a neuropsychologist, uh, and I spend most of my week diagnosing brain disease and disorders, I'm going to diagnose these ugly lies so that you never forget them. Let's start. The first ugly lie about creativity research in the brain is that you have to be some sort of freaking genius to be creative. <laughs> this couldn't be farther from the truth. Albert Einstein, the creative icon of the 21st century, comes immediately to mind as the creative genius that, that, that typifies this big C notion of creativity. We heard about Leonardo da Vinci earlier. There's any number of examples of these creative icons. From Marie Curie, like I said, Leonardo da Vinci, these creative big C icons. And we spend so much attention focused on these big C icons that we forget about the other end of the distribution. <laughs> the poor saps like you and me, who are trying to be creative, but we're doing it, we're doing it okay. <laughs> But, but, but we're struggling a little bit. Is that the same creative process that's going on in the brains of individuals like this as is going on in those big C creative uh, brains? This is the little c creativity. This is what I study, is little c creativity. So this is a normal distribution of creativity. And this particular disorder I like to call plebophobia. This is an unhealthy fear of the middle part of the distribution. The next disorder that I'd like to bring your attention to is also pernicious in our thoughts of creativity. And it is this notion that you have to be somehow crazy to be creative. And we have any number of icons of creative genius and, and mental illness from Van Gogh who cut his ear off, Virginia Woolf who stuffed rocks into her coat and walked into the river, George O'Keefe was depressed apparently, and John Nash won the Nobel Prize, but was schizophrenic. Uh, we have this, this, this romantic notion uh, that you have to be mentally ill to be creative. Uh, this is also false. And none of these people created their works in the throes of their mental illness, whether it be depression, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. In fact, all of them created it when they were in their healthy state. I call this particular disorder mentally illophilia. This is an unhealthy association of mental illness with, with creativity. Now finally, uh, we have a very pernicious disorder that I'd like to go over, and this is the so-called left brain, right brain crowd. How many of you heard about this? Yeah. 
uh, creativity is in the right brain, right? Well, uh, where did this come from, this notion that creativity is in the right hemisphere? Let me tell you. This came from two researchers, Roger Speary on the right and Michael Gazanik. Roger Speary was a neurosurgeon and Michael Gazaniger was a neuroscientist. And they worked together in the 70s. And what they did is they worked with patients who had epilepsy. And what they did is they severed the corpus callosum. It's this white matter fiber bundle in the center of the brain that connects the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. Previous to their studies, it was thought that the left hemisphere was dominant. Of course, it did language. And it was the smart hemisphere. The right hemisphere was dumb. It was just hanging on. It did nothing. <laughs> The interesting thing, when they severed the corpus callosum, it cured the patients of epilepsy because the seizure could not traverse from one side to the other, but they also found that the hemispheres functioned rather independently. The right hemisphere was not so dumb after all. The left hemisphere did do language, it was logical and linear. The right hemisphere was more synthetic. It, it could do nonverbal reasoning. It could even do some language functions. Now this took off like wildfire in the popular press, especially when uh, Dr. Speary won the Nobel Prize in 1981. And this became the right hemisphere notion of creativity. And I call this particular disorder horny, horribly over-interpreting research <laughs> regarding neurosurgical intervention. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever meet someone that, that is horny for the right hemisphere, uh, my best advice is just to back away. <laughs> so, that's the ugly lies that you've been told about creativity. Now I'd like to cover some good that is emerging in, in, in creativity research. And, and, and there is some good. There are foundational truths that are starting to emerge about creativity research in the brain. And the first foundational truth comes from Dean Keith Simonton, who's a big brain out of the University of California, Davis. And Dean Keith Simonton came up with this axiom, this first principle of creativity research. Now, he applied this to scientific creativity, but it applies to all of creativity. And I want to share this with you because it's extremely important. This axiom, this law of creativity goes like this. Scientific creativity constitutes a form of constrained stochastic behavior. That is, it can be accurately modeled as a quasi-random combinatorial process. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> so I, I thought about this for a little while. And the, the basic essence of this notion is this, that in order to have a good idea, you must have many ideas. Every creative person out there puts out a lot of ideas, whether, whether it's a scientist or an entrepreneur or an artist. And you have a lot of examples of this. In science, for example, my discipline, the Nobel Prize winners out in the world are invariably characterized by having lots and lots of publications, hundreds of publications. Now those publications are of two main varieties. The first variety is publications that are widely cited. These are gems in the, in the world of scientific discourse. These are hits because they're used by other scientists, they're novel, they're useful. The other variety are so, uh, publications that have been cited zero times. These are scientific duds. These are from Nobel, science, Nobel Prize winners. How can they have publications with zero citations to them? Because they're putting out a lot of ideas. And with those many ideas, some are invariably going to be duds. Now I have another example for you. Pablo Picasso, over the course of his lifetime, put out some 18,646 individual pieces of art. They are not all Guernica, I can attest to you. I traveled to a large country in Europe recently, and I was very excited to see that a museum in the city was touting itself as having one of the largest collection of Picassos around. I went to this museum with my wife. I have never seen so many crappy Picassos in my life. <laughs> Picasso was trying out different ideas over the course of his career. Some of them were duds. Some of them were gems. Some, one of them was Guernica, this iconic creative example. That's how creativity works. It's this blind variation and selection process back and forth, this novel and usefulness. This is the concept that I'm trying to get in your brain. 
Now, there's always an exception, exception that disproves the rule, and the exception in this case is something like To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee, right? One masterful work of art. How did that happen? Well, perhaps the selection process is going on in her brain rather than out in the world. We don't know. We need to learn that process. But I think that process is still going on. There's a blind variation in the selection process going on. Okay. Another important concept is this notion that creativity is not one thing, it is many. And I want to walk you through another friend of mine, Arne Dietrich, a collaborator. And he does theory before he does studies. So this is the theory that he came up before we did any of our studies. And this theory is important. In creativity, there's a knowledge domain. And you can have cognitive types of creativity and emotional aspects of creativity. And in the processing mode, you have deliberate types of creativity and spontaneous. Now let me walk you through this and populate this. So when you think about the deliberate cognitive mode, these are types of people like scientists, architects, entrepreneurs. This is a very knowledge-driven type of creative activity. Albert Einstein would go in this quadrant. When you think of the deliberate emotional type of creativity, you think more of artists who are working in the emotional domain. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe or uh, writers, Virginia Woolf, people like this who are working in an emotional domain but doing this in a deliberate cognitive mode. When you get down to the spontaneous processing mode, this is really interesting uh, because the brain works in a conscious and a subconscious mode. There's stuff that's going on in our heads, in our brains, where nerve cells are firing, but they aren't quite in our conscious awareness. And the spontaneous mode, I think, is very interesting. If you think about the emotional domain, I think music comes to mind. When you think of improvisational musicians, Miles Davis, or you think about comedians who get up and just start doing improvisational humor or riffing. So this spontaneous mode where you have a knowledge set, but you're working within a limbic kind of domain, and you're doing it in a spontaneous way. Finally, in the spontaneous cognitive mode, this is where insight comes in. Uh, Archimedes, when he had to figure out how to measure the gold in a crown, cried Eureka when taking a bath, right? This is because he, he figured that you could lower this crown into the bath and measure the displacement of the amount of gold in, in that bath by the uh, amount of water that it displaced. This moment of insight, or Kekula, who, who awoke from a reverie and thought of a snake swallowing its own tail and thought of a benzene ring. You have this whole notion of the periodic table of elements starting to emerge. So you have different types of creativity, cognitive and emotional, deliberate and spontaneous. These probably map onto different aspects of brain functioning as well. More cortical elements, more limbic elements, more subcortical elements when you have spontaneous uh, uh, types of processes occurring. Now finally, I need to leave some time. The bad of creativity research is not bad so much as badass. <laughs> <laughs> because look what we can do. This is my brain popped out of my head and spinning around. And, and we can take measures of the cortical mantle, the subcortical mantle, the gray and white matter, and from these measurements, we can do science. This is pretty badass. <laughs> now, the brain is enormously complex, so we have to know where to start. And there's a group of patients with frontotemporal dementia. And this is a disease of the frontal lobe. And you can see in these patients that the frontal lobes are a bit knackered. The gyri are thinned and uh, um, atrophied in these patients. And just briefly, uh, these patients are interesting because in a select case of cases, you have artistic expression emerge spontaneously from these patients. This is a, a, an example on the left of a patient who took up painting with frontotemporal dementia. And it's very painterly on the left. But some eight years after that first painting was uh, painted, when she was grossly disinhibited from frontotemporal dementia, she painted the one on the right which in my view is much more artistic and creative. It captures the spirit of these horses. So the frontal lobes probably have something to do with creativity. And it's not more frontal lobes, it's less. Stockbrokers and housewives are, are picking up piano lessons and picking up paintbrushes and becoming creative in this process. So in our study, we looked at 131 
modern lab rats of the 21st century college undergraduates. And we tried to get them to be creative in the lab. And you have to trust me that, uh, that we did this. We used measures of convergent thinking, divergent thinking, insight, uh, reasoning, personality measures. And just to go over this briefly, the blue regions are regions in which their creative capacity was significantly correlated in, in the gray matter regions of their brain. The thickness of their gray matter was significantly correlated with their creativity. And the blue is the thinness of that. So thinner cortex, higher creativity. This is fascinating. And you see it's in regions throughout the brain. It's in the frontal lobe. It's in the temporal lobes. There's some regions where there's increased cortex, but this was not the essence of the story. The invariable essence of the story was less is better, a disinhibiting process of the brain. Our second study, we looked at the white matter of the brain, the cables that connect up these cortical networks. And we found the same story emerging. The green regions are all the white matter tracks that we could have analyzed in the brain. And what we found is there was this very specific region in the frontal lobe where the creative expression of these individuals was inversely correlated with their fidelity of the white matter tracks. So they have lower white matter integrity, higher creativity. This, again, is fascinating. Less is better. What does this all mean? That you should go out to the frontal lobotomy? <laughs> well, the, the, the important notion is that creativity is a complex story. For some individuals, and in certain situations, you want to downregulate the frontal lobes. You want to take the brakes off. Some people go for long walks. Some people exercise until they're exhausted. Some people drink. I'm not recommending this approach. But the main idea is downregulation of frontal lobes to increase creative capacity. But remember, there's a flip side of creativity where you need to refine ideas hypothesis tests, converge on one that will work, that you'll put out in the world. Will it work? Will people like it? Is it revolutionary? It's this back and forth with creativity research that is with uh, creative capacity that's important. Now I worry that we are not cultivating creativity in our culture and in our schools as we should. That we are filling our heads with a lot of knowledge but we are not leaving enough time to allow new connections in those knowledge nodes to emerge. Are we building our brains to be stronger creatively? Thank you.